From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, a very good morning. I'm Manus Cranny in for Jonathan Farrow. It was a banger of a jobs number, 303,000. Up went the yields in the market, but the equity market for now embraces the good news story on payrolls Friday. Come down to the open. Kicks in right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up, it is another hot U.S. payrolls report. Treasury yields and the dollar spike on the data and investors continue to adjust the rate cutting bets. We begin with the big issue. It is Jobs Day in the USA and another upside surprise. Bloomberg's Mike McKee is side by side with me. 303,000 start of the day is... <laughs> I'd say that's it. I mean, that's uh, the biggest uh, rise we've seen in about a year. And it also suggests that uh, we are seeing ongoing strength in the overall economy that will keep the Fed sidelined for longer, which is the way the markets are taking it. Payrolls, 303,000. Net revisions, 22,000, breaking a string of several months of revisions down. Unemployment falls to 3.8 percent. Average hourly earnings come in just about as expected, 0.3 and 4.1 percent on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, that is the trend that they want to see at the Fed. So it doesn't suggest that this strength in the economy means they need to consider raising rates or anything like that. The interesting thing that we have been seeing is this debate about whether or not we are permanently in a higher hiring pattern. When you look at non-farm payrolls, they've been over 200,000 for quite some time. And the Fed has said we need about 100,000 to sort of be neutral, to not have uh, employment that is pushing inflation higher. So we're well above that, and we're not pushing inflation higher at the moment. So that suggests that we could see this kind of strength go on, which would have implications for monetary policy. Where were the jobs? Pretty much in the same places we usually see them. Healthcare up 72,000, government up 71,000. Construction was interesting. There was a thought because it was strong last month, it wouldn't be as strong this month, but look at the numbers, 39,000. And of course, as always, leisure and hospitality continues to add. This is the first month, Manus, that leisure and hospitality got back to the level of employment it had before the pandemic. And finally, the establishment versus household. There's a, been a debate about whether undocumented workers are taking over, are really filling in some of this uh, labor force. And what people cited was the uh, decline in the household survey for a couple of months. But now all of a sudden we had uh, 489,000 people added to the household survey jobs number, which was even higher than the establishment survey payroll. So I'm not sure where that leaves that theory, but we can tell you that all of this leaves the markets thinking the Fed might not move till September. Well, they're certainly pushing that out in the swaps market, aren't they, Mike? Uh, the first rate cut now to September from July. It's been incrementally moving out through the week. The Sage of Wall Street and BlackRock, it is Rick Reader. Rick, good to see you. Jobs Day, here we are. It's justifiable to be cautious, prudent, patient. The Fed are right to give us that tone, given the backdrop of this jobs report. Agree or disagree? So I agree, but I, listen, I think when you step back, there's something really impressive going on here. Mike talked about it. We're bringing more and more people into the workforce, some through immigration. I, you know, I'm a big believer in effective immigration, but you're actually putting more and more people to work because you're expanding the workforce. I've talked about it actually because of work from home. You're actually increasing the size of the female population in the workforce. Think about what this means if you're the Fed. You actually brought a lot of people in the workforce you're hiring a lot of people, leisure, hospitality, health care, uh, education, government, not as interest rate sensitive those areas, leisure and hospitality maybe a bit. But what you're doing is you're growing the potential of the economy. And if you look at average hourly earnings, they actually didn't go up. So what's happening is you're expanding the workforce, putting a lot of people to work. And actually, you're not pressuring wages of any significant magnitude because you're expanding the workforce. Supply side story, pretty darn impressive. Is the Fed, can the Fed be more patient? Maybe, but you know, you think about what's happening. We see this in all the data. Lower income people are getting hurt by some of this. Some of the demand function, the cyclical parts of the economy are under pressure. 
could the Fed still get the rate down from five and three eighths since we're getting you know core PC inflations at uh, inflation we think will be at running at two and a half percent? I still think they're going to move, and I still think they want to move. You know, could they be a bit more patient for sure? But listen, I think when you step back, the story's a pretty good one for the U.S. economy. No, it's a very bullish story. Stocks are doing well. Yields are popping a little bit higher. You say it's a supply side, and that is demonstrable in the numbers. So the non-aggressive spike in wages, that is presumably adding into a lower ECI that builds to the narrative that you said we will get insurance cuts. We've got Torsten Schlock coming on the blog right now saying he sticks with zero cuts. You call insurance cuts. What are your insurance cuts to zero at Apollo? So I would say a couple of things from my perspective. I think the uh, I think listen. I think the Fed would still like to get two to three cuts in this year. I you know you need to see the data improve. You need to see the inflation data. I think our data suggests you're going to get core PCE numbers over the next couple of months of 0.2 type of readings month on month. That'll get your core PCE down to a run rate of about two and a half over the next couple of months. Two and a half core PC, five and three-ish funds rate. I'm not saying the Fed needs to get away from a restrictive policy given the strength of the economy. But even if you got 100 base points off the funds rate, you're still operating at a restrictive level. So I still think they'd like to do it. We need the data to support it. We think we'll get that. But listen, we got to see it first for sure. Look, obviously, and that's why we're getting all of this rhetoric about more confidence and take more time. And then Kashkari flies the kite of zero hikes. Um, can you, you, you just don't see that as a possibility. You think we will get them. So therefore, on the spikes in yield, this goes back to, we had the same conversation a month ago, uh, didn't we? Which was, do you want to step in and buy the spike in duration? Just a clean cut answer on that before we move on. <laughs> so I love buying the front to the belly of the yield curve in income producing assets, credit, uh, the securitized market. You can clip a coupon of six, six and a half percent, my new ETF bank. It's trading 680 yield. Even if rates go up 20, 25 basis points, you think about what happens, you still carry it over 50 basis points. You still create income over 50 basis points a month. You carry right through it. That I'm definitely comfortable buying. Front, you know, Pricing in the Fed anything more than a couple of cuts, I, I wouldn't do that today. And so, no, we're not adding any significant duration. In fact, we've cut some. But, the, uh, but I, like, I love owning this income because you, you, your income works for you even if even if rates move moderately higher. And this is where the real money potentially comes in, doesn't it? Um, can, we, can we get a quick view on oil? Oil is over $90. You know, if we look at yesterday, yesterday had three different things happening, didn't it, Rick? It had oil spiking on $90, geopolitics, Netanyahu's next step against Iran, Iran against Israel. We also had data uh, to contend with as well, and Kashkari flying the kite of zero. To what extent is the left tail risk of stagflation now materially more present perhaps than it was a month ago when we last caught up? No, I, don't, I don't believe in stagflation. I mean, I think the, the reason why energy prices are moving higher or oil prices are moving higher, there are, you've got an economy, obviously the mid East situation which caused that, that spike over the last uh, 24 hours. Yep. But the economy is operating at a pretty good level. Consumption is operating at a pretty good level. And actually the high frequency data out of China is a, is a bit better. And so you're starting to see that. You're seeing that in some of the data globally. So I think you've got what is a pretty decent consumption story that's booing some of those levels. And then obviously the exogenous from the Mideast is creating some of the recent move. And in terms of the price action, as you say, over the past 24 hours, to a certain extent, I put it to you that that was the bond market showing its reaction function as a hedge. So, yeah, 100%. You know, it took, it took a little while, but it did show the bond market. Listen, I mean, it'll be interesting to watch at the end of the day in terms of how we go into the weekend because you've got, when you've got news swirling, long-end interest rates don't do a lot today given the, the nature of the curve. I've talked about, you know, owning the belly of the curve, owning a lot of income. Like, why do you need long-end interest rates with a curve this flat and with the Treasury after you issue a tremendous amount? There is only one time you really need it is if you believe you have some exogenous. So having some long-term interest rate at times makes uh, will make some sense and you could see that like you say you know when you get shocked events it does tend to be a useful a useful tool 
The thing that I think is extraordinary today is the volatility of the equity market where it's priced. The VIX, you know, we do a lot of trading in the, uh, in the options market. Volatility is crazy cheap in equities. I'd much rather use that to manage my risk than count on long-term interest rates to be, you know, with the data we're seeing, to be my ballast in the portfolio. So tell me, would you be a buyer of VIX? Would you actually be prepared to spend money on buying protection? Because various people have come on board here and they've said, actually, we quite like writing volatility at this stage and clip it, clipping the income there, clipping the basis points there. <laughs> Make it be completely clear. I love buying volatility in the equity market. And, you know, there are some parts of it you can sell, some single name, like some of the names, some of the companies that have run up quite a bit in tech. Can you write some volatility, some call options against it? Can you overwrite some of the positions for sure? But gosh, we're, we've been able to, to continue to buy gamma, buy call options with volatility under 10 on the index, on the S&P 500. If you believe, which I do, that equities will go higher, you don't, you don't have to run a big risk position just by using call options and using volatility in the market. Rate volatility has been, I mean, think about, you know, we're talking about rates moving around. The 10-year note hasn't really moved a lot. Rate volatility is actually high. Equity volatility, I think, is amazingly cheap, particularly if you trade the underlying collateral, the delta. You know, if you, you think about what happened the last two days, you had the, the S&P 500 moved, what is it, uh, the, so we moved 100 handles yesterday, so 3 and 3% three ish, a little less than 3%. Like, I don't know. That's a pretty good. If you're not paying for the volatility and you can move your position around relative to it, I think equity volatility is really, really attractive. That'll be the line in 2024. I love spending money on volatility. That, that's definitely, we're supposed to be talking about bonds and you and I have ended up talking about buying, buying equity volatility. So, we're both going to get into trouble. Um, <laughs> just to sort of close it off, the debate we had Bill Dudley yesterday, of course, talking about where the term, where, you know, where we will end up and saying that Essentially, the Fed is wrong. The Fed's down there at, what, 275, and the market is at, you know, three and a quarter, give or take, depend, depending on where we are in the day. So, so where do you see that, that terminal rate? So, by the way, I, I actually don't think we're talking to different, in different uh, arenas around the, uh, around the dynamic that we talked about. If you can build a lot of income in a portfolio, this is nirvana in fixed income. If you can clip a six, six and a half percent, you have some money to play with to buy some volatility, cheap volatility in the equity market. So I actually think it's, I actually think they work hand in glove pretty, pretty well with one another. Listen, I think you have to assume the terminal rate, and you know certainly uh, when you hear Fed governors, Fed presidents talk about it, they, the, the, the discussion is a higher terminal rate. You know, what I argue, you know, we're going to see a lot around AI over the next couple of years. We're yeah. going to see a lot about how, how uh, so listen, I think, I think you have to assume the terminal rate's a bit higher. You know, is it three-ish? Is it, is it, you know, around that zone? I think we're going to learn a lot in the next couple of years. And I've said, put money to work. Think about your investing with a 12-month time frame because between AI how U.S. China develops, how elections go. We're going to get a lot more information to determine where we're going to be two years hence. And uh, I'd rather make the decisions for what's going to happen in the next 12 months, six months to 12 months. Yeah, I, I, I think we will have a much, much clearer. We'll have an, a U.S. election under our belt with some clarity uh, in terms of who might be in the White House. And that, Rick, of course, has got big implications on the fiscal uh, trajectory for the U.S. Uh, Rick. Good to have you with me, Rick Reader there, uh, on the reaction to the jobs report. If you're just tuning in at 9.12, where have you been? 303,000 jobs were created uh, and a participation rate that goes up. The opening bell is just over 18 minutes away. Abigail Doolittle is with me. Despite yields being higher, Manus, on that hot jobs report, we do have uh, tech stocks in particular staying higher, including Netflix up 1.2%. This, of course, also is pivotal, has uh, moved its price target to a street high of $765, suggesting 20% uh, upside. Shockwave Medical up 1.7%. J&J is buying the medical device company for $13 billion. And then Tesla not joining in on the tech party. This on news that they are offering steep discounts on SUVs piling up on big inventory, Manus. Abby, thank you very much. Coming up, payrolls Friday. We get the reaction from the White House. Anne-Marie Hordern sitting into the seat. She'll catch up with the acting Labour Secretary, Julie Sue in just a moment. That conversation not to be missed on Bloomberg. On Bloomberg TV and radio, I'm Manus Cranny in for Jonathan Farrow. Let's get to Anne-Marie Hordern. She joins us now with a very special guest from Washington, D.C.
Thank you so much, Matt. As we had that blowout jobs report, we're pleased to be now joined by acting U.S. Labor Sector Secretary Julie Sue. Julie, thank you so much for joining us, um, coming in on this very hot upside surprise when it comes to the non-farm payrolls number. What was interesting, though, is the labor force participation rate in increased more than expected to 62.7 percent. Where do you see this supply coming from? Good question. So yes, this was another incredible uh, jobs report, right? 303,000 jobs um, created, bringing the total since President Biden came into office to 15.2 million. Unemployment rate remains at historic lows. And yes, the labor force participation rate overall increased. And that number actually comes a lot from, from, from young workers, from teenagers. So the overall, just in the prime age um, workforce remained uh, steadier. So that's where that supply is coming from. There's a lot of talk, though, this is also coming in from higher immigration, both documented and undocumented. Are you seeing that as well? So our numbers demonstrate that that particular data point is coming from young workers. But certainly, you know, a, a positive um, economy, a strong jobs, um, uh, you know, um, situation is good for all workers, immigrants included. So um, we are certainly also seeing, you know, immigrant workers um, and native born workers really be part of this, uh, this overall story of, of growth that's much higher than expected, not just this month, but over the last several months. Jay Powell talked about this earlier this week. He didn't want to get political when he talked about immigration policy, but he said he wants to call the strikes in the balls of how he sees it, which is more immigration, creating a bigger economy with more capacity instead of a tighter economy. Is that what you see, a growing economy, maybe because of this influx of immigration? Well, so we continue to see this tight labor market in part because we're seeing growth in jobs and uh, and labor force participation rate high, right? But to your point, you know, immigrants have long contributed to a strong economy, and so this overall high GDP, yes, is a function both of again immigration and uh, immigrant participation in the workforce and overall participation. You know, the, these unemployment rates uh, at being at historic lows are true um, pretty much across across the board. One area where we didn't see any improvement was manufacturing employment after a drop last month. We spoke about this last month where there's a loss of 10,000 jobs in February. The president likes to talk about boost in manufacturing space. Why are we not seeing more of that? Yeah, that's right. So we've seen about, you know, over 700,000 jobs in manufacturing created since the president came into office. This last month, we saw one of the industries of large growth was in construction, especially specialty construction. So these are carpenters, these are electricians. And so there's building going on. And you got to, you know, build the factories before uh, you have people working in them. Uh, and so we've seen steady growth, um, but the, the manufacturing kind of follows the construction and this is a moment of historic investments as part of the president's investing in America agenda in both of those industries and 2024 will continue to be a big year uh, in manufacturing. But Julie when you look at the blue wall Wisconsin Pennsylvania Michigan these three key industrial swing states a collective 39,000 fewer people are working in manufacturing than five years ago. Where are those manufacturing jobs going and how uneasy does it make you that the blue wall is losing key manufacturing jobs? So the president's been very clear. We are going to make things in America. We've invented them here. We should be able to make them here. That is part of the like truly unprecedented investments in industries, including in manufacturing. I've been to Michigan, I've been to Wisconsin, and we're seeing working people in apprenticeship programs that are bursting at the seams. We're seeing people talk about a sense of security, about a career that they're now going to have that they didn't see possible um, just a few years ago. So the, the, that's the trend. Uh, the numbers don't lie. The numbers reflect that also. Um, and again, we're seeing them in construction, which had his, you know, really big growth last month, um, and we will continue to see growth. Uh, again, you know, it, there's sort, it's sort of one has to uh, come before the other, uh, and manufacturing is an area of big investments um, and uh, under President Biden. And I, I, I trust that those numbers will be reflected as we go forward. Right, but less people have been working there since five years ago in those three states. Wh where are they going? 
Yeah, so you know, we're not afraid to tackle hard problems, right? And one of them is to reverse the trend that you're talking about. There was a, a long time trend before President Biden came in of, of manufacturing moving overseas. The president said very clearly, not on my watch, not anymore. That's a function of wanting the jobs to be here, wanting them to be good jobs that provide a pathway to the American dream, but also about a resilient supply chain. It's about our national security. And so all of those are part of the vision that he came into office with and frankly you know the the growth that we've seen over the last three years was not promised most people said it could not happen uh, and across you know, again all industries there has been growth much of it returning to pre-pandemic levels right we're talking about hospitals and healthcare. care we're talking about local education local education returned to pre-pandemic levels for the first time this past month and we will continue to uh, to see growth in manufacturing not by accident but because of the investments uh, in the Investing in America agenda. The unemployment rate, 3.8%. It's been lower than 4% for more than two years now, but that's not for everyone. The report shows unemployment rate for black Americans increased in March. Why is this moving in the wrong direction for black Americans? So we pay very close attention to that. Uh, you know, again, if you look at the trends over the last three years, the black-white unemployment gap is at also historically low levels. That's because the president has also been very clear. We are not going to build the economy we want if we leave anyone behind. And so a lot of our work at the Department of Labor has been focused on making sure that there are uh, apprenticeship programs, pathways to good jobs in all communities, including in the black community. Uh, we did see a... a an uptick uh, that the the black unemployment rate there was um, primarily for black women so we're keeping a very very close eye on that and um, and we'll continue to work on closing that uh, that gap between black white unemployment acting labor secretary Julie Sue we thank you for your time this morning uh, Manis really a, a blowout report that unemployment rate for the, for the president is going to be something certainly key they love to tout this statistic that for more than two years now it's been under four percent Swift avoidance there, of course, uh, in, in terms of answering where have the jobs gone in that blue wall, which, of course, we did the polling in that recently with the morning consult poll. Uh, Amory Horda in there with the acting U.S. Labor Secretary, Julie Sue, coming up. Your morning calls. And a little bit later, Amory and I will catch up with the Deputy Treasury Secretary, Wally Adeyemo, joining us both to discuss the payrolls report, Yellen's trip to China. That's on Bloomberg. Embrace your U.S. exceptionalism. The equity market certainly does. Yields might be pipping a little bit higher, but this equity market is trying to find favor with that exceptional story. 303,000 in the jobs report. That's pretty hot. Let me tell you what's hot on Wall Street. This is what the scribes are writing. First off, Pivotal. That raises Netflix price to 765 bucks, highlighting a solid momentum in streaming. Piper Sander upgrades Krispy Kreme to overweight, expecting his recent par partnership with McDonald's to be the game changer. Oh. Crispy creams. Finally, Seaport Global upgrades Fox to a buy, seeing a jump in political ad spending going into the election. Coming up, Amory Hordarn and myself sit down with Treasury, Deputy Treasury Secretary. It is Wally Adiemo on Bloomberg. The American economy is vibrant. 303,000 jobs were created. Manufacturing might be a little bit of a headwind, but this equity market at the moment is trying to see the unique exceptionalism in the numbers. Nasdaq up by three tenths of one percent. Levi's are ringing the bell. This is great. Uh, apparently, baggy jeans are back in fashion. Who would have thought? Bring back the bell bottoms, I say. There is the opening bell. We're open. We're bid. Strong jobs report. Wages are good. Participation rate is higher. What is not to love? in this market. Let me tell you what else is going on. The dollar is bid all the way around against every single G10 currency. There you go. The euro is down by three tenths of one percent at the moment. You're having 10 year yields pop a little bit higher by six tenths of one percent. You're almost at this year's high again as we see the risk of uh, perhaps renewed inflation. Uh, that is also oil over $90 at home in Europe. But of course in New York we're at 80 seven dollars up four tenths of one percent there is a tightness in the oil market as geopolitical tension rises and that 
is giving you a bid up oil market. There's one stock to watch at the open. It is Tesla, the EV maker, offering big discounts on the best-selling vehicles as its inventories pile up. Craig Trudell is with us. Craig, this is another roll of the dice at Tesla. More price cuts. Everything the market does not really want. Yeah, that's right. And we've seen them cutting prices left and right for more than a year now. This is a little bit different where they're actually cutting uh, prices of their vehicles in inventory. And the problem that they have here is they have a lot more of those uh, at the moment. They made almost 50,000 more vehicles than they delivered last quarter. And this is uh, something that has become, you know, uh, you know, something investors have become accustomed to because seven out of the last eight quarters they've done that. And so uh, th this is, uh, you know, a, a pretty drastic move on their part because you're able to get your hands on a Model Y for much cheaper uh, than, than you would if you were to custom order one. The big question will be just how long they stick with this small price hike that uh, they uh, moved to at the beginning of this month. Uh, just based on where deliveries have been, it's hard to believe that that will stick for, for very long. Craig, thank you very much. Let's turn our attention to manufacturing. We've got Greenbrier reporting revenue that beat the average analyst estimates. Abigail Doolittle has the detail. Abby. Investors really liking this report, man, as the stock up 9%, its best day in almost a year. And this company, of course, is a supplier of equipment and services to freight transportation markets. They beat both top and bottom line estimates 20% better on the bottom. That was a dollar three in adjusted earnings. They updated their guidance to a range that is above what uh, was expected. Now, this stock up more than 70% over the last year. Even so, valuation still a Attractive, trading at a PE, forward PE of about 13 times. That's at a discount to the group. There is a 6.2% short interest matter. So I think on these good results, today's uh, pop up 7.5% right now could be a bit of a short squeeze. Okay, well, we'll leave it there. Abby, thank you very much. Flip over to tech. Now, Apple have laid off more than 600 employees. It's part of a set of decisions to end the car project and the smartwatch display projects. Ed, has the details. This is a residual, Ed, really, isn't it, from a, yeah, a strategy I, pivot? I'd call it a size and scope uh, understanding of all the reporting Bloomberg's done over the last years. A Apple's up three tenths of one percent is actually down on the week more than a percentage point, on track for three straight weeks of declines, matching the poor run of form that it had at the end of 2023. And the headlines have been difficult for them. So these are warn notices that are filed with the California Employment Development Department. So we know where those jobs were cut geographically within California, the specific addresses where we know teams were working on both Project Titan and the display project, which has also uh, been paired back. Mark Gurman makes a really interesting point in his reporting that this is just California. Project Titan, the, the car project and other projects that have been impacted that we know about through the war notices have a footprint outside of California in states like Arizona. So the 600 number is very small in the scheme of Apple's overall employee base, but it's likely not the full picture. It's been a difficult week for Apple. Uh, you and I have been talking a lot about the robot that follows you around the house. Why do we need a robot that follows us around the house? And we're up two-tenths of a percent, but it's been a rough week. I can always do a bit of help on the housekeeping. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ed Ludlow, there on the latest from Apple. Well, joining us now for more on the payrolls report is the Deputy Treasury Secretary, Wally Adiemo. Uh, Bloomberg's Amory Hordern, side by side with me. Good to see you, Deputy, Tre Deputy Secretary. Uh, we've had a great jobs report. Amory and I have spent time talking about that. The debate is this, and we just had it with, with Julie Sue, is about immigration and to what extent. It's a hot political issue. But how much more embracing of immigration does this administration and the country need to do? Because it keeps, a pre it keeps the pressure off the wage spikes, doesn't it? We should start with the fact that the president, in the beginning of his term, proposed comprehensive immigration reform because he understands the importance of us doing two things. One, making sure that we secure our border, but also that we have a sensible immigration policy that, to your point, helps us drive a successful economy. And when you look at the 300,000 jobs that were created in the United States this month, it's on top of historic gains in the labor market we've made over the last few years, where we're seeing wages grow faster than inflation and we're seeing a robust u.s economy because of the policies the president's put in, in place including his he's calling for and continues to call for us to do the right thing when it comes to immigration reform but that participation rate has ticked higher 
Jay Powell's talking about it's a bigger economy, not a tighter economy because of immigration. Do you see that, whether it's documented or undocumented workers coming into America that are filling some of these jobs? I think it's important for us to remember that one of the things we've been focused on since the end of the pandemic is dealing with supply constraints. Some of those supply constraints we're in the labor market as well. And I think that while you're focused on immigration, we've done a lot to reduce supply constraints for, Amer for all types of Americans. Look at female participation in the economy. We've seen black female unemployment rates go down as well, but seen more black women enter the labor force than at any point since um, in modern history. Our goal is to do everything we can to take the people who want to work in this country and make sure they have the ability to do that by giving them the skills they need, working with companies to make sure we get labor in the right place. And the president's committed to doing everything we can to reduce these supply constraints because we know they're key to reducing inflation in the economy. Well, black Americans, though, unemployment rate ticked higher, 6.4 percent, at a time when we see the president's poll numbers are softer with black Americans, with Hispanics. How much of a political headwind is this for you? So it's important to remember that where we started. And when we came into office at the beginning of the Biden administration, black unemployment was above 16 percent. It's come down to historic lows. And I was in the Obama administration, and it took us years to see unemployment come down during the great financial crisis. And we've seen far faster movement there. There's more work that we need to do. But in addition to seeing unemployment rates reduce, we've seen historic gains in terms of the starts of black small businesses and small businesses run by people of color, which have been historic in our country's history as well. So our goal is to make sure that we do everything we can, not only to create well-paying jobs, but to create opportunities for people to build wealth by creating things like small businesses. And what the president's made clear is that we know the job isn't done. We've got more to do, and we have an agenda that it allows these small businesses to get access to two things they want, capital and customers, which are key. Let's pivot to Janet Yellen. She's just touched down in, in China, and to a certain extent, it plays to some of the themes that you've just laid out, which is about making American jobs real and good for the economy. What is a tangible success from this trip for Yellen? Let's start from the standpoint that Secretary Yellen's going to China from a position of strength in the U.S. economy. Our economy is growing faster, it's more competitive than any economy around the world. And the reason for that is because of the policy choices that we've made. And success for the Secretary is to explain to the Chinese that the policy choices they're making today, which are leading to overcapacity, are not only not good for the global economy, it's not good for China's economy. They went and over-invested in property. And now they're dealing with that concern. By overinvesting in these industries, they're going to create concerns for themselves. And probably the most important thing you've seen the secretary do was her meeting with business leaders, not just from the United States, but from Japan and mm -hmm. Europe. Because our goal here is to create a level playing field for companies around the world. Because what we know is that when there's a level playing field, American companies win. So we want to make sure that the Chinese recognize that it's not their concern is not just with the United States. It's with the global community where we all are saying to them clearly that you need to address your overcapacity issues because it is not only hurting us, it's hurting you. Mm -hmm. She also hinted at this pending tariff review. What's the status? So the tariff review is in the hands of our colleagues at the U.S. Trade Representative's Office. I'll leave it to them. But what I will say is that we're, demonstra we're talking with our allies and partners around the world about the use of tools when it comes to making sure that we address un uncompetitive activity coming from China. Well, you're not just talking to them. There's, there's active pressure. I mean, senior officials will travel to, to what, the Netherlands next week to put more pressure on the Dutch to really hold back on chip. But I don't think we have to put pressure on them. Look at the Brazilians, look at the Mexicans, look at all these countries. Okay, they well, we can use the word pressure or support. They are, we can they use the word doing, pressure or support. Yeah, they, but they're Deputy doing this Secretary. on their own, not because of America, but because it matters to You're them. You're telling me that the delegation are going to go to Holland and that it's not, it's not under any kind of pressure to deliver, to be in sync with the United States of America. When you look at the, the officials in the Netherlands or the officials in Brazil, the Brazilians care deeply about the Brazilian steel market. That's why they're thinking about going after uncompetitive behavior from China. These countries fundamentally care about their workers just as much as we care about our workers. And we want to work together as allies and partners to make clear to China that we want to compete with you on a level playing field. But when you take actions that hurt our workers and hurt our companies that are not competitive, we're going to act in unison to hold you accountable. You're talking about a multilateral approach when it comes to China. Yet at the same time, the president has announced his opposition for the Nippon Steel deal. The Japanese have come out and said, actually, this means that we would be united against China. Which is it? Our goal is to work closely with our allies and partners to build a global economy. But not economy at the expense of for, union jobs? That works for all of us, including building 
jobs in all of our economies. Fundamentally, we just did a deal with the Chinese, with the Japanese, excuse me, that allows us to work together to build a clean energy supply chain, the um, critical minerals agreement with, with Japan. But we do believe that it's important that we invest here at home in building strong jobs here in the United States, which we've done, and the labor numbers today demonstrate that. We think it's possible to do both things, invest here at home, but also to build out a global supply chain that benefits not just the United States, but Japan and all of our allies. And that's exactly what the president is doing. And that's why we think that working together with those same allies, be it Japan, be it Europe, to address China's overcapacity is important. That's why the secretary, in meeting with business leaders from the international community, didn't just meet with American business leaders, but met with business leaders from Europe and from Japan as well, because our con we share the same concerns. But you see how sometimes there can be mis mixed messages to some U.S. allies. Back to the Nippon Steel deal, though. Is, is it dead or what? I'm not going to comment on a private sector deal. That's not my role. What I can tell you, though, is that we're very invested in building a domestic steel industry that can supply the investments we're making here at home, which include the, infra the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act, and the IRA investments that are happening here. And when you look at the numbers today and you see the growth in employment in the country, that's being driven by the policy choices the president has made. And our goal is to make sure that that doesn't only benefit the American people, but benefits our allies and partners as well as we're building out global supply chains. We're going into the spring meetings uh, in a couple of weeks. When you look around the world, you're talking about growth here in America. It is exceptional and it is pretty unique relative to the rest of the world. As you go into these spring meetings... I think the thing we don't talk enough is that the reason that that growth is happening is because of our outstanding companies here in the United States, but because of the policy choices we made in the United States that are different than policy choices made in other countries and the president's agenda. And I think our goal has to be, as the spring meetings happen, that we drive a message well, the growth, to the rest the growth, of the world. The growth, to be fair, is driven in part by stimulus, and it is driven by part the, the, the lasting effect of the COVID stimulus on the consumer. So that, that is a policy-driven, uh, let's say, recovery relative to the rest of the world. What's the biggest concern as you go to these spring meetings? What's your message at these spring meetings with the global leaders? You've talked about them three times now during this, this conversation? I think the key for us is to make sure that we address overcapacity because that is a global issue that we all face, but that we also take steps to continue to drive growth in the global economy. And that while the United States, we're making investments in the energy transition through the Inflation Reduction Act, we want to make sure that other countries are making similar investments because we know that we can't solve the climate crisis alone in the United States. And we also know that as we think about the en energy in general, we want to be in a position where we're transitioning away from fossil fuels not only because of the climate impact, but also because of the energy security um, issues. Can that I just face. squeeze this in? You're putting a lot of emphasis right now on climate and energy security. If that is, if that is the case, if climate is the big goal, then why not let the market do its job and let in Chinese EVs? Well, if it was market determined, that would be one thing. But the reason that China's EVs are flooding the market is because of state subsidies. And fundamentally, one of the things that we learned from the pandemic, but we also learned in general from geopolitical situations, is you don't want to have one supplier of any one good. You don't want to go from Russia supplying gas to Europe to China being the only supplier of solar panels or EVs to the world. Would you agree that in terms of the EV infrastructure that this administration, respectfully, has not achieved its goals? We're still working at our goals. As you know, the IRA is a 10-year bill that's making huge investments, not only in the supply side, but also in the demand side of our economy, and we're seeing results. In the United States, we've seen $600 billion of an announced investment in the economy driven by the president's bills. And when you look at the job numbers today and you look at those job numbers and the investment numbers in the economy, those are being driven by policy choices we made here in the United States. And we're going to continue to make those policy choices to make sure that America's economy outperforms the rest of the world. Deputy Secretary, thank you so much for joining us. That is Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally Adeyemo uh, joining us both with Amri Horda and around the desk. Coming up on the show, markets digest those payroll numbers. Something really impressive going on here. You're actually putting more and more people to work because you're expanding the workforce. That conversation up next with P. James Greg Peters and Mona Mahajan with me from Edward Jones on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Abigail Doolittle. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, an interview with Levi President and CEO Michelle Gass. That's at 11 a.m. Eastern and 4 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg.
and you step back, there's something really impressive going on here. You're actually putting more and more people to work because you're expanding the workforce. The story's a pretty good one for the U.S. economy. It is another blowout payrolls report. Let's discuss that and the implication for markets. My guests, Mona Mahajan of Edward Jones and PGM's Greg Peters. Mahajan, Greg, good to see you. Mahajan, this is what you say. The bull market is built on a full head of steam with the mood brightening into what is looking increasingly like a full blown optimism. Well, we just handed you a 303 number on the jobs report, a participation rate that's rising without runaway wages. This is Nirvana, Mona. Good morning. Good morning. And yeah, you summarized it well. Look, this is giving whiffs of of a bit of Goldilocks here. You know, not only did we get the 303,000 number well above expectations, we are now looking at an unemployment rate 3.8 percent, uh, 26 months in a row of, of sub 4 percent unemployment in the U.S. We haven't really seen that since the 1960s. Uh, and then, of course, all of that may have been worrisome if we saw that wage gain figure actually tick higher if all these new jobs created were leading to higher wage growth, which would lead to higher services inflation. But what we are seeing, in fact, is a moderation in the wage gains. Uh, on a month-on-month -month basis, we're getting 0.3 percent, but an annual basis, 4.1 percent, is a tick lower from the 4.3 percent we saw last month. So the trend is in the right direction. The Fed is certainly watching the wage gain figure closely as well as it is a direct it has a direct implication in the services inflation figure. More broadly, I'll just add that mm -hmm. it does feel like there's better supply and demand, as the Fed has been noting, too, in the labor market here in the U.S. We are seeing an uptick in participation, and we're seeing a downtrend in the number of job openings. So less demand, more supply, which is creating this kind of gradual cooling in the labor market that we wanted to see. Mona, stay with us, because we've got Peter with us. Now, Peter, I know that, to quote you, I've become officially exhausted from the non-stop Fed speak uh, that we've had. So, you know, it's here we are. We've got a debate now. We've got really, really strong numbers again in this jobs report. Kashkari flies the kite of no interest rate cuts. To what extent is this equity market in the United States of America exempt from rate cuts? Does it really need rate cuts? And does it need rate cuts to run higher? Well, I don't think it needs rate cuts necessarily, but you know, if you look at real rates, um, if you look at the scope for uh, moderating rates, it's a, it's around being less restrictive, right? It's not about being accommodative, and I think that matters and matters a lot. So you're looking at real rates at two percent. Uh, there is scope for rates to move lower. So our call all along has been fifty to seventy-five basis points. I think that's you know still very much in play. But if you look at, you know, kind of dissect uh, uh, the options market, uh, what you're seeing is this probability of rate hikes, right? And so just roll back the clock. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, earlier this year, it was almost a foregone conclusion that you'd get 50 in March. And now we're talking about pushing it off, pushing it off, and even the prospect for rate hikes. But, but bottom line is, it's about the data, and the data are really strong. That's why I keep saying tune out uh, the Fed rhetoric, because we're just following the data, right? It doesn't matter what they say. It's ma it matters what the data comes in. And I think that's the important thing to focus on. And that data has already pushed one full rate cut from July into September. So again, the market is ahead of the Fed, and that gap is widening again. There is this differential between the two. You, you mentioned the word rate hike there. Do you, do you see any tail risk of, of a hike, or is that just market conjecture and media spec? I do. I, I mean, there's always a risk. I would say uh, in most investors' mind, it was a zero probability, and I think it's closer to a 10 percent. Um, uh, and so as as uh, the data comes in strong, as the labor market continues to uh, chug along, yeah, wages have moderated, uh, but they're still at a very high level. Uh, that is the key to uh, okay. uh, kind of the future uh, inflation outlook. Uh, there is that prospect. So, um I, I don't think it's off the table here. Uh, so the economy is strong, and I think investors need to look at why the rate behavior is the, the way it is, and it's because of stronger growth and inflation that's uh, actually you know still above trend. 
Mona, for you, there is th this broadening of, of risk on the equity side. Um, I look at the energy market, and the energy market is juiced because of geopolitical, heightened geopolitical risk and tight, tight potentially deficit markets. Your breadth that you're going for in energy, does that endure? Will you add to that? And are you concerned about the events in the past 24 hours that may well indeed embolden the energy component of this market? Yeah, you know, I think broadly our call on market leadership broadening beyond uh, large cap technology here in the U.S. is driven by the fundamentals around earnings growth we think will broaden this year beyond just, you know, the large cap technology or growth parts of the market. We should see other parts of the market, including energy, financials, industrials, materials, uh, sectors that actually benefit when the economy holds up and even reaccelerates, which we think could be the uh, potential outcome, especially if inflation cools and the Fed starts uh, thinking or signaling rate cuts by year end. Uh, that's an environment where the consumer will start picking up as well. So we do think this broadening of market participation will happen, and it's starting to show some signs of life already. We have seen sectors outside of tech um, have leadership in the first quarter of 2024, and we've also seen areas like mid-cap stocks pick up as well. To your point on the geopolitical tensions, typically those do manifest through the oil and commodity markets, and that's exactly what we saw yesterday. Uh, and really over the course of the last few weeks, but um, certainly came to a head yesterday when there was an escalation in geopolitical tension. We saw an escalation in WTI, oil commodity prices. Uh, that actually weighed heavily on stock markets um, and sent bond markets into a kind of flight to safety mode. So, you know, we'd say the geopolitical tension is actually something that, you know, we are still hopeful that we get a de-escalation rather than a re-escalation. That's the better outcome for the global economy. Uh, but the okay. broadening of participation, we think, can happen either way. Mona, thank you so much, Mona Mahajan and Ed, of Edward Jones and Greg Peters of PGM Fixed Income. My guests this morning, first reactions to the jobs report. Coming up on the sector price action this morning, Abigail Doolittle is with me. Well, Manus, we do have a gain for the S&P 500 of six-tenths of one percent. Despite that hot jobs action, discretionary services and technology, those are the sectors that are higher despite yields up too. On the week, though, we are looking at a down week, down more than one percent earlier, the worst week of the year. But now we're actually... Uh, off of those lows of so the worst week since January. Most of the sectors on the week, Menace, they are lower. Okay. I thank you very much, Abby. Trading Diaries up next in terms of what you should be watching for the rest of the week. Have a good weekend. But the solar eclipse comes on Monday. Get your sunglasses out. Congress returns from recess on Tuesday. Wednesday, it is CPI. So more discussion around the inflation narrative here in the United States of America. Initial jobless claims and OPEC's monthly report hits the tape on Thursday. And that oil market is on fire at the moment. Quite literally lit up. Finally, the big bank earnings on Friday, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo and City all post results. That was your countdown to the open for this week on Jobs Day. 303,000 jobs delivered without a serious blow higher on the wages. Bonds are spiking a little bit higher in terms of yields. Equities remain robust. Good morning from New York. This is Bloomberg.